Thank you very much that I can come here to talk a little bit about the jungle of regulation in the crypto space. So my, what I would like to achieve is to bring you up to speed what at the moment is going on. I have 20 minutes time to tell you a little bit what we experience in the regulatory field and what we actually know, what we can expect. Secondly, I would like to talk about what could Switzerland do, you know, to be one of the forefront jurisdiction in this field. And finally, at the end, I would go run through the risk and functionality uh, discussion of crypto assets in order to have you qualified as qualified crypto investors. Because, you know, what we see is that if you want to be an investor into this field, you know, we need to create a new term of accredited investors. In the past, it was just the funds you hold and a little bit of experience in the investment area. Now, what you need to have, you need to have a technical understanding of what is behind tokenized ecosystem cryptocurrency. So the last part of my, let's say, what I want to achieve is actually to run you through in, to an investor suitability program so that you can say, okay, I was in St. Moritz, now actually I passed the crypto investor suitability test. Now we have 20 minutes time to do that. So if we talk about crypto, if we talk about cryptocurrency, crypto tokens, coins, bitcoins, whatsoever, what we actually talk about is a decentralized ecosystem. The decentralized ecosystem, and uh, we don't have the time in 20 minutes to go into detailed regulation questions, regulatory questions, whether it's a security in the US, whether it's a security in Liechtenstein, Switzerland, or whatsoever, but what we should keep on the principles. So I would like to guide you through the main principles, legal relevant principles related to tokenized ecosystems. Now we have three challenges. No jurisdictions at the moment has a legal base to deal with it. Second challenge, although there is a decentralized ecosystem, we need centralized rules. I'll come later. To that. And the last one is, if we have a decentralized ecosystem, which we cannot integrate in an already existing, existing ecosystem, it does not work. So let's start with the first challenge. We need a new legal concept. If you see what the decentralized, let's say what a crypto technology can do, it's amazing. And for me, the one of the most disruptive element of the crypto technology is that it can actually form, and it's our term, so it's not a, it's not, it's not a let's say, a, um, uh, an official term, but what we think is, if we look at the functionality of the crypto technology, it has all elements to create property. And it took me a long time actually to experience, to actually to come to this conclusion, and I had to use my old legal textbook of 19, old century, uh, to go, and I actually went through this book and I was studying the, 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 the definition of property. It's exclusive, you can have exclusive access, you can define it, you can publicly transfer it, that people can see that you can, it's transferable, and you can enforce it. And this is the challenge of the crypto space. And that's why I like, you know, and, and I say it in every speech, I like the term Bitcoin. Because it is, by the end of the day, it's a bit, it's a program, which is in a way technology programmed that it has all the functionality of a coin. You can possess it. And that is an inc that's the incredible disruptive element of this technology. i give you some examples, real-time examples. One of our clients, very uh, um, successful entrepreneur in the Bitcoins, in, in, the, in, the, in the crypto space, all reinve all, uh, early investor in Bitcoins, holds millions now in this bit of, of Bitcoins, is in the process of divorce comes to me and says, hey, Luca, I mean, you are a crypto specialist, you know, I, I'm in the middle of divorce, how shall I handle it, you know? And then I said, my friend, I mean, I know a lot about Bitcoin and stuff like this, but I'm not a divorce lawyer. <laughs> and then he told me, listen, you know, I'm in the middle of divorce, but I tell you something, I will not give one Bitcoin to my wife. 
And then I told him, listen, guy, I mean, it's divorce law. I mean, you have to actually, half of it belongs to your wife, whether you like it or not, this is law. <coughs> and then he tells me, you know, you might be right, Mueller, but I will not give her my private key. <laughs> so that's it. End of the story. <laughs> End of the story. And you know, if you don't have a private key, you can actually get a judgment. Hey, Luca, or the other guy, you know, Half of the Bitcoin belongs, and the, 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 the nice thing is the wife can actually, if, if he knows the public address, and she can calculate how much the friend or the former husband or has, you know. But if this guy says, no, I, I mean, you can shoot me before I actually hand over the private key, she doesn't get it. And this show, this example shall show you, show you this incredible, libertarian, exclusive, bloody approach of this technology. This is the highly disruptive element. And that's why, you know, why it's so challenging for the regulators and governments. And if you see also a, 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 the background, let's say a, a constitutional background. The constitutional background is, you know, if you go through, and that was also an experience, and I came, was reading my books about legal history, Savigny, 17th century or 18th century, when they start to develop, to change from a feudal system into a democratic libertarian system, one of the elements they created at that time, for us absolutely clear, is a constitutional right of property, which, by the end, it's the only commercial defense right you, as citizen, have against, has, have against governments. There's no other. And the whole economy is based on your defense right against governments to protect your property. And now what you have here is a technology which is the ultimate execution of this defense right. If you hold the private key, you hold it. The disadvantage is, if you lose it, you lose it. <laughs> you know? And that makes especially if we advise banks, and Benjamin uh, told it, you know, from a technology point of view, if we advise banks, you know, in holding cryptocurrency for their clients, you know, the storage of private keys and the access, wallet services, this will be the challenge of the future. Here you have the biggest risks. So, you see, for us, from a legal point of view, we need to deal with it. We need to know what do we really have with this Blockchain assets, what is it really? At the moment, no answers. We have two approaches. We discuss it within the legal team. Can we use a very aggressive digital interpretation of existing laws? Or do we, not, do we need to create a new law? We might create a new law to actually deal with new digital property questions. Now, the second issue is we have decentralized ecosystems. And, you know, we are from the early movement, and we come there and, you know, we hear, guys, we need to be fully democratic, fully decentralized. Does not work. You need centralized element in a decentralized ecosystem. Let me start with the last one. Give you here an example. We have a technology, we have a, a, a client which actually has a very interesting new Facebook application which allows to deploy content to the Facebook, attach a, a let's say, a property stamp to it so that you know it's my property information. And if you want to actually look at this information, use this information, pay me for this information, all embedded into a Facebook with direct property rights register as well as a payment functionality. Very interesting. And the plan was to deploy this D app decentralized without any control. Now, it doesn't work. If you have child pornography or terrorist financing elements in it, it will be shot down, if it can be shot down. So I don't believe personally 
in the fully decentralized application. There will always be a centralized element in it for a clean and legal ecosystem. Now, the, the elements of a centralization here, I will not dig into more in detail because it, they relate more to initial coin offerings and we will hear about initial coin offerings, I guess, tomorrow. Now, what is a challenge is we have these decentralized ecosystems, we have these different token functionalities, I will come to this point later on as well. How do we interface with the users? Now, if one is a technology element, one is the project, how do we interface with the users? And here we see the highest grade of potential liability. Because, you know, you have to sell something by the end of the day. You have to explain something. This is also something which not can be done fully decentralized. You will always have a communication and or web interface with which, with which you communicate to your users. So the question of terms, prospectus, will be relevant in the future, depending on what kind of functionality of tokens you have. So as an investor, this will be one of the relevant information and documents you will have to study. Now, also the user, let's say, Interface infrastructure, as I said, the wallet. Very often, you know, the, it's, it's, people focus on the application. Focus on, okay, we have a Luca Muller token. But people forget to think, where do I hold this Muller token? How can I transfer this Muller token? So, the future banking applications, the future technology banking application for me will be, in the challenge for these will be in the wallet. The banks of the futures of the future will be wallets. And the wallet functionality will be the most important thing if you provide services in this space. Now, the second or let's say third element, is the marketplace infrastructure. Here we face, at the moment, the biggest issues, because of two reasons. First, there is not a defined definition of what is a security and what not. Because, you know, your exchange infrastructure license requirement changes the moment you trade securities. As long as you do not trade securities, you're not regulated. Once you trade, securities you are in. However, basic principle of fair trade do still apply. So at the moment, we do not know how do really the exchanges which we use, to what extent are they really reliable or not. Because a clear exchange, let's say, legislation does not exist at the moment. The Another issue which is in interesting is already very challenging is the interface with the existing banks. As Benjamin said, you know, the challenge is you need to have also a fiat wallet. And here we need to work together with the existing bank how much of KYC AML is used is needed in order to have this interface between let's say old style fiat and new style crypto wallet. So this integration will be a challenge and this is something which we actually, there are some solutions, there are some discussions ongoing uh, and uh, we, see, we will see a result hopefully by in, in the first quarter of 2018 for Switzerland. Now, coming into the, let's say, um, analysis world, how do you functionally approach an analysis of a token. We propose a three-step analysis. As uh, Benjamin said, you start actually with the functionality. I'll come to this point later on as well. What functionality a token has? And here, the biggest mistakes always happen. Because very often, people think an Ether is the same as a Bitcoin. Wrong other functionality, complete other functionality. 
So here you need an understanding what actually the underlying protocol, and here is the second relevant qualification or let's say data set for a risk assessment of a token, what does the underlying protocol allow you to do with this specific token? So the functionality side is more like a legal tax relevant discussion. And the underlying protocol is the technical risk assessment part. Has there been a fork in the past? How many versions of a protocol do exist? How many nodes? How long? Was there any interruption? Things like this. It's a technical assessment. And then the last level or set of data which are relevant for a risk assessment is the market. In which market? And how has the token been distributed? There's a different type of regulation if we have a token in the, elect in, let's say, in the, in electro let's say in the um, electricity production environment or in a public, uh, in, in private information for um, medical detailed information or in the financial sector. So for us, these are when we evaluate uh, the tokens or we start to actually enter into a risk assessment of each token. We did that for, for the 100 uh, listed tokens. This is the basic set which for our analysis of a risk assessment of each of the tokens. Now, we heard that we should rather adapt a functional classification rather than a legal. Because in a, with a legal, um, with a legal um, classification, you can do that in Switzerland. But if you go to Germany, the Germans say, hey, my German, we have complete other, we based on the Bürgerliche Gesetzbuch, it's a little bit older than yours, we have another classification. If you go to the US, hey, gosh, what, come, oh, forget it, Mueller, this is nothing, well, we do something else. But here, no, that's why we stopped, we started with the classification already in 2016, and what we learned is, we have to do it as functional as possible. Because you need to actually explain the functionalities. If you have the functionalities, you leave it up to every jurisdiction to do whatever they want with a described functionality. The functionality is the factual element, and then the legal assessment can be done by each jurisdiction. So we have basically three classes. The PCP class one are the utility infrastructure, native tokens as you call them. They have no legal counterparty whatsoever. You need to know that as investors. If Bitcoin protocol is not functioning, who's liable? You need to know that. And the second class is for us the BCP class two, which will be for us one of the most challenging in the future. Because here, you are not using the tokenized ecosystem elements to establish such a decentralized ecosystem with like, for example, like uh, the Bitcoin and Ethers, they are they belong to class one. But here you used the technology for a decentralized execution of the transactions. You use the technology for a platform. And you can very efficiently use this platform to speed up all different kinds of process, issuing debts, IPOs, so debt cert um, share certificates, an incredible possibility how you can use this BCP class too. And here we will have the big challenges also for the, reg the regulations. For example, with Liechtenstein, uh, we are now in the process of discussing, for example, the e-money application to tokens. And this is, uh, maybe Benjamin, you can Talk, we, we can talk about this issue a bit later on, but it's a very interesting approach they have regarding this e-money uh, regulation application for the BCP2s. BCP class 3 is the future. That means, you know, you really can have direct ownership to something. You hold the token, you own it. You own, let's say, an underlying asset. Now, when you see the different risk assessment categories, what we say is, okay, we have an element of functionality risks, storage and access risks, we have regulation money laundering related risks, and market and counterparty related risks. We think in order to bring 
the decentralized to token is, uh, ecosystem into the investor world, we need to have a more structural and functional approach to deal with these crypto assets. Not like, oh, it's all money laundering, it's crop, whatever. So we have to embrace this technology, use this technology because it's an incredible technology, and use what we learned in the past. Because, if we, I mean, we did 150, 200 years of banking. Use it, apply it in an intelligent way, not overregulated, and I tell you, we will, be, oh, sorry, this picture is stupid. And we will be absolutely successful in Switzerland and around the world. Thank you very much.